<laughs> good morning, saints. Welcome. Good to see so many people here this morning. Welcome to those that might be viewing online. Uh, SACEF is open for business, and we're thankful to see so many faces here and some new faces here also. Uh, my name is Dan Schluter, and I am tasked rather easily with uh, bringing you some of the announcements for this morning and getting things underway. First of all, uh, some announcements. The elders have planned a congregational discussion meeting for this evening at 5 p.m. right here. Everyone's encouraged to attend. There are copies on the welcome table in the back that you passed by of the agenda and the survey that Brett had emailed out. Uh, he'll give a spotlight very shortly uh, with further considerations for the meeting and therefore there is no volleyball tonight. No volleyball tonight. Uh, typically, that would be on a Sunday evening. So if you do want to play volleyball, look for it next Sunday. Outbound Youth resumes in two weeks. Uh, Sunday, uh, that would be September 3rd at 5.30. They will meet until 7. Volleyball will meet after that until 8. All right? So you have a packed thing, packed weekend coming up, uh, Sunday coming up uh, September 3rd. All right. We now have a special media presentation that Brett has put together. And uh, uh, this is just going to be viewed, so I'll step aside.
This presentation reiterates the direction the former and current elders have envisioned for many years. It is not a new direction, but maybe a new way of explaining it. We are currently in a state of restoration. God continues to restore what is broken in us, our trust, our hope. The major internal conflicts of the last several years have resolved. However, these conflicts have left many injured and have distracted us from the mission God has assigned us. Many of us have healed from our injuries, but some are still healing and all have some scar tissue. We the elders believe that we are now collectively well enough to resume our mission and head for the destination. The envisioned destination and planned route to get there are based on several navigational principles. One, the word guides us, the spirit propels us. Two, we the people are the church, not this campus nor our activities. Three, the universal church consists of all the followers of Jesus worldwide. The local church is a subset of that universal church gathered in a certain geographic area with a common purpose, common beliefs, common values. Five, making disciples is the mission of both the universal and local church. Six, this local church makes disciples within our circles of relationships. Seven, we are not in competition with the other churches. There are over 120,000 people in St. Mary's County and at least 40 things we would call churches that works out to be 3,000 people per church, more than enough to fill every building all day long. Eight, we value growing in maturity over growing in numbers. Nine, the preservation and the maintenance of the things and the traditions is not a valid mission. We believe God's desire is for us to return to being a highly cohesive family of individuals each one deliberately becoming like Jesus, head, heart, hands, knees, and feet, effectively executing the Great Commission by using the assets and activities here to make self-replicating disciples here in St. Mary's County and support disciple-making missionaries elsewhere in the world. We believe the path to get us from where we are to where God wants us to to be requires several things. We are to train, equip, and motivate each other to be biblically fluent, holy in conduct, continuous in prayer, and discipling others. We need to engage our existing circles of relationships, neighbors, friends, social and vocational networks, something called the sunflower model, and substantially support disciple-making missionaries around the world. The sunflower model is really just a visual depiction of how God has put us each in the middle of many different circles of relationships. These different circles look like petals on a flower that all join together at you or me, each one of us. There are a variety of people in these circles some are lost and without Jesus. Some are church. Some are believers who are still maturing in their walk with Jesus. The people that we know in our different circles, these are our outreach assignments. Very much like Nehemiah assigned each family to work on the wall near their house. So whether you have lost people who need to hear the gospel or church people who need to be challenged in their spiritual maturity, or people who are sincerely following Jesus but need encouragement or discipling, I exhort each of us to be very intentional about being Jesus' head, heart, hands, knees, and feet in the various circles of relationships God's put us in. Because of our relatively small town, where we all tend to kind of know each other, some of the petals or our circles of relationships overlap. Some of us share the same person or same people in our different petals. These overlaps are a chance for us to work together with another brother or sister here or in another church 
that we can pray together and work together to shine the light of Jesus on the person that we have in common and work on making disciples together. However, to be a healthy sunflower, several things are needed. Water and dissolved nutrients come from the soil, sunlight, gaseous nutrients from the air. All three must be present to have a healthy sunflower. For each of us to be a healthy sunflower, we need similar things. The soil is the church where we receive nutrients and our roots go down. The air is the spirit and the sun is the word. And we all need all three in order to thrive. When we are gathered together, either in larger or smaller groups, we should be engaged in these activities. We should worship together, train and equip one another, fellowship, which involves encouraging one another, ministering to one another, and carrying each other's burdens. And we should engage the visitors who join us in our groups. When we are not gathered together in large or small groups, there are a number of things that we should be doing. We should be worshiping individually, our individual expressions, acknowledging God's greatness and his worthiness. We should be working to become personally closer to Jesus and more like him through individual prayer times and our time in the word. And we should be engaging our different circles of relationships with the gospel. It's important to state the things we're not trying to do. We're not trying to be bigger for bigger sake. We want those who are here to be more mature. We're not trying to cater to everyone's desires by having a program or activity for every taste. We are not trying to force unnatural engagement relationships. We're not trying to have a holy huddle here where we all hide out from the evil world around us. We are not trying to make attendance at activities the main marker of spiritual maturity. We're not trying to preserve and protect our traditions and facilities just to have them. And we're not trying to be cute, gimmicky, or glitzy. We hope this presentation helps remind us of the destination that we're trying to reach and the steps to get there. This vision and direction for our future together is intended to help us all make the many big and small decisions needed in the coming months. As always, we desire to have clarity and understanding. So please communicate with us any questions or concerns you have about this. Now let's resume the mission and the important work that God created this church to do. I don't think I've ever been accused of being cute or gim uh, gimmicky, but <laughs> anyway, thank you, Brett, for putting that together. Thank you, elders, together on that thought. Um, right now, we're going to spend a moment and uh, address the element of giving. It is time for a, an object lesson here. Um, young people, this is actually called a check. <laughs> You actually are taking money out of your earnings, and this represents your earnings, and you're giving it physically in a box over there, if you wish, uh, to say, you know what? I think the Lord could probably use this for mission field or for uh, improvements or for paying some bills or you know, that meeting needs. So this paper check, which apparently is fading out, I do not have any way to pay. There, there's PayPal out there. There's, uh, there's, you can read little dots on a page and whatever and transfer funds. But uh, anyway, old school folks, nice to see you all here. And if you, can, if, if you do have that checkbook still, you can put it in the box right over there. You can pay online, uh, but you know, give online, that is. But uh, think about extending the Lord's work. And this is one thing that I'm reflecting on very briefly. When they used to pass the plate, Years ago, by the way, young people, there was a plate that they used to pass, pre-COVID, all right? They used to pass a plate. It was not uncommon for mom and dad to reach into a pocket and take out a, a dollar or take out 50 cents and hand it to the little one 
so that they could put it in the plate. That wasn't just a cute gesture. That was a demonstration. The next step <clears throat> from that little child is them to realize, hey, I was out cutting a lawn. I was out babysitting. I was out. I need to take something from that and put it in the plate. All right? So I want you to think about that for a minute. Train your young people to give. All right? It is, it is, a, it is an expression out of the heart there, out of the heart and the soul. All right. So uh, if you've already done so, thank you very much. Thank you for folks online who have donated in the mission. Now, let's go to the element of communion. We'll shift over to communion right now. I have... Um, Chosen Ephesians 2, many of you would recognize this, uh, and I did not elaborate a whole lot on this, but I'd like to take a look briefly at Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Now we come to the question of the gathering of the saints, and that's why I greeted you first thing this morning, the gathering of the saints. And when Christ is in the upper room, and he has brought them together for Passover. He is looking at his m most closely held followers. And they're not sure. They're not steady. They're a bit un they're unsettled about this entire affair coming up. They, they've got some vibes. They're not sure. There's great uncertainty. And now we come to Ephesians, written by Paul, who wasn't there, but Paul is looking at a church that probably also shares some uncertainty. Believers of various states of, of confirmation. And he addresses them with words of comfort and direction. So let's take a look at that. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out our desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Then comes one of the most powerful words, but God. So here we are, Completely lost. Christ looking at the 12, you were once of this world. You're fishermen, you're tax collectors, you're a zealot, right? Now, you're the faith that has been imparted to you, but through God. Being rich in mercy, because the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised, up, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now the tense there can be rather interesting. Because Christ is talking like multi-tense, not just past, not just present. Multi-tense reference there. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. The cup and the bread does not save. There are some churches that sort of lean that direction. No, this is the brotherhood, the sisterhood, the fellowship of the saints confessing Christ. That's what it is. <clears throat> For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of your own works, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What a joy it is to walk into a Christian school and walk onto a court and meet a whole bunch of 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade girls and get them, get them playing and close every practice in prayer. And some of them are not believers but they're being exposed day by day, like the sunflower, through sports, through mentorship, through guiding. What a joy. Find a way to reach out and show your faith that way. Those works have been prepared for you ahead of time. So as Christ looks at the, the apostles, all the works that you will do have been prepared for you ahead of time. Fulfill it. 
So now we take our bread and cup. If you've taken one from the back, it's time to pray and ask God to bless this communion. Let's pray. Lord, among the brothers and sisters here, there are so many faithful. They're dedicated. They've confessed you publicly. They've confessed you in, in testimonies to others. They've given of themselves only through the works that you have prepared for them, and we are grateful. Thank you now to bow before you and to take the bread and the cup and to reflect upon the relationship that we have. Thank you for your mercies toward us, that you have counted us worthy of continuing to bear the cross. Thank you for this time that we can gather and to accept communion in thy name. Amen.
Front two rows are bad rows today. I begin today by posing three imaginary but realistic situations that any of you might face. First, say you're busy, maybe at work, maybe at school. Someone with whom you've had past tension invites you to come and talk things over. This will require like maybe a drive up to DC, take a day out of your busy schedule. You're not eager about that, but talking things over is good, right? Resolving issues. Does the Lord want you to redeem your time this way or not? Second situation. Let's say a person, an untrustworthy person, contacts you and says, Hey, look, I know what you've done. I got some dirt on you. I'm going to blab to a bunch of important somebodies about your missteps, your nefarious intentions, unless we all sit down and negotiate some things. Well, you don't think any of this person, what they think is true, but, but, but what if others do think it's true? I mean, you don't want to get in trouble. Should you take some time to set this matter straight with them, to ward off bigger problems? What would Jesus do with this one? Situation number three, you're in a, a precarious situation. There's some danger involved. It could, it could be physical danger, danger to your finances, danger to your relationships. And a colleague says, hey, you're not safe where you are. Come stay with me this evening over in such, such a place where, where God's presence is nearby, where you won't be threatened. But the proposal has got some sketchiness to it because you've been convicted in the past that the Lord doesn't want you in that location. Oh, but, but there is some danger, and, and you trust this colleague. Well, maybe in these difficult circumstances, this is the Lord's way of guarding you. Right? So what are you going to do? It's been a few weeks since we left Nehemiah, overcoming some community problems that threatened to blow his project up from within. Um, by way of review, those of you who might have missed, Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah was going to prayer about his project and then building the walls. In chapter 2, he was planning and encouraging people. And then in chapter 3, they assigned a piece of the wall to each family. Uh, overcame a bunch of obstacles in chapter 4. And then uh, Sean was here a few weeks ago, uh, ruining dinner with politics as there was some internal struggles they had to overcome and injustice they had to fix. By now, Nehemiah has been appointed governor. And we saw from Sean's teaching of chapter 5, chapter five that Nehemiah undid some of the, the heavy burdens 
the raw many of the people during this famine. And in so doing, Nehemiah fulfilled in part what Isaiah had written in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6. Is this not the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke or, or the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Nehemiah did that. Now the, the team is nearing completion of the building. But as it continues, Nehemiah faces in chapter 6 three situations like the ones I posed a little bit ago. He faces problems of words, words that bait, words that threaten, words that tempt. How did Nehemiah handle these? How is he an example to us? How did the Lord deliver Nehemiah from these evil plots, and how will he deliver us as well? We sung a couple of psalms already today. I'd like to open today by praying a psalm. So this is going to be different. You, you, it is legitimate. You can pray with your eyes open. It, it's better closed for a lot of reasons. You don't get distracted. But in order for us to pray this together, I'm going to, we're going to put the psalm or piece of a psalm on the screen. This is a psalm of protection from enemies. And so I'd like us to pray this together as we open this morning. So pray with me out loud, if you will, please. Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their heart and stir up wars continually. They make their tongue sharp as a serpent's, and under their lips is the venom of asps. Selah. Guard me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have planned to trip up my feet. The arrogant have hidden a trap for me, and with cords they have spread a net. Beside the way they have set snares for me. Selah. Verse 11. Let not the slanderer be established in the land. Let evil hunt down the violent man speedily. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and will execute justice for the needy. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. Amen. Open please to Nehemiah chapter 6 if you're not already there. Nehemiah faces situation number one in verses one and two. Nehemiah 6, 1. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab <clears throat> and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come and let us meet together at Hakafirim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. Here we have our three stooges again, Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem. The work's almost done. They say, hey, come to meet me in Ono. Oh, no. Which could sound funny. But it's really only playing words in English. You have to realize in Hebrew it doesn't sound like, oh, no. But this seems almost like the elementary school when the bully said, come meet me outside after school. And you know he wasn't coming to talk. Right? But how did Nehemiah know their intent? Well, we, we don't know. It's not stated. But there was obviously some discernment going on here. He's like, yeah, this is not a good idea, talking things over with these guys. So what does he answer? Verses 3 and 4. And I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. Their baiting was persistent again and again. And Nehemiah... Well, his answer, let's look at this. His answer was true, but it, it was limited, right? He said, I can't come down busy. He didn't say, 
look, I, I know I'm not coming because I know you really want to put me out of commission. He didn't accuse them. But he also didn't lie. He merely said only what was needed to say. No, I'm not coming. So an application here, you know, you're not required to give complete rationale for your answer to someone, especially if their query is not sincere. You're required by God not to deceive, but sometimes less information is better. Don't feel a false obligation to divulge everything to just anybody. And note, Nehemiah consistently gave the same answer every time. Man of consistency, huh? So, is that situation number one? So principle here, I want to take away, when you get baited, an ungodly person who does not have your best interest or God's best interest at heart should be avoided. The supposed olive branch of peace might be poison. So you can just leave it. In spite of like, you want, well, I just want to engage. Yeah, I just want to engage too. Sometimes, not good. Situation number two, we see in verses five through seven. In the same way, Sanballat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. You know what open letter is? Open letter is not like for your eyes only. It's I'm bringing this letter, it's to you, but everybody's reading it. <laughs> open letter in his hand. And it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you're building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There's a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Oh, how sweet. It's reported. There have been rumors of these things. With no source, so you can't refute it because there's nobody to go talk to. I, that happened to me once. I was in a legal setting, and someone said, you know, there, there's been rumors of embezzlement around this guy. Well, guess who was helping spread the rumors? So <laughs> it, it was technically true. <laughs> but rumors are hard to deal with, right? And this tactic was not new here. Um, if we went back to Ezra, the book before this, chapter 4, this same tactic was being used back then by the same people and interrupted the work of the temple building for 16 years. They got so threatened by the stuff they had to stop. And so it's not an idle threat. Okay, there's something really here. You're like, okay, I got to deal with this. So what do you do, Nehemiah? Do you take counsel with this guy? Sit down, try and explain the truth? I mean, you don't want the authorities stopping your project, right? Because it's almost done. Well, Nehemiah says in verses 8 and 9, Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Nehemiah realizes their intent, again, is not to take counsel, but to frighten, to discourage. So he tells Sanballat, all you got is lies from your own little head. So the answer is still no. I'm not coming to take my valuable time and waste it with you. And if Sanballat runs the tattle to the king, so be it. Which you have to admit is taking kind of a big chance, right? But Nehemiah is trusting the Lord to work it out, isn't he? Right? What did he end with? But now, oh God, strengthen my hands. He, Nehemiah is back to prayer again, again. Lord, I, I'm doing what I think is right. Now help me put this behind me, Lord. Don't let me waste time worrying. Strengthen us to get this project done we're doing for you. Lord, you got this. Um, for a little context, uh, these were not the only baitings going on. Uh, Nehemiah adds a postscript at the end of chapter 6. I'm going to bring the end of chapter 6 up here 
So you can see it, verses 17 to 19, as I jump down. Verses 17 and following says, Moreover, in, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, stooge number two, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and his son Jehohanan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. They also spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. Tobiah is in good with some people. They like him. He married into the Jewish family, apparently, right? So it's, Nehemiah's getting a little bit of, come on, Nehemiah, why can't you get along with this guy? I mean, he's doing some good stuff. Well, the problem is Tobiah and Sanballat and Geshem are opposed to what God wants done. So it doesn't matter if they're likable. It doesn't matter if they're important. It doesn't matter if they're married to the right people. So principle number two for dealing with rumors, you don't need to respond to false or phony threats. And don't need to be frightened by lies because the truth will defend you. Again, I'm going to quote from Isaiah chapter 58, following in verse 8. Your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. I know who stands before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Dealing with that. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, Tom, these situations weren't all that difficult. I mean, if a bad guy asks you to do something, isn't that a giveaway you shouldn't listen? Does Superman choose to meet with Lex Luthor in a dark alley? Right? If Darth Vader says, let's make a deal, you simply say no because it's Darth Vader, right? And if you're thinking that, you've got a good point. But I need to emphasize that despite what seems obvious, when some of us are criticized, our natural response can be to wish to defend our honor, the Lord's name, our reputation, and we fall into these traps of, oh, let's just talk about it. Let's move on to situation number three, where a supposed good guy makes a request to Nehemiah. In verse 10. Now... When I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deleah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. Oh! Now this, this Shemaiah, Shemaiah, He's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. There are other Shemaiahs in the Bible. It's not this Shemaiah guy. So we don't know anything else about him, his father, his grandfather. But, but he seems like a good guy here, right? He's confined to his house. We don't know if that was a disability, a disease, or something else, but he's stuck at home. Nehemiah goes to visit him, and Shemaiah says, you know, you're in a lot of danger, Nehemiah, as if Nehemiah didn't. No, he was in a lot of danger already. So you're in a lot of danger. Um, I got a solution. It's practical and it's spiritual. Let's go somewhere and lock the doors. In fact, let's go to a place of the Lord's protection. Nobody would dare come harm you in the temple, right? Doesn't that sound good? If you're a youngster playing tag, the temple would be like base, you know, where you can't get tagged because I'm safe in the temple, right? So this is a good thing. Nehemiah's answer is in verse 11. But I said, should a man, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? Uh, I will not go in. Now first, sometimes despite danger, a person in authority needs to stay and face the danger because of their position, right? You think about, Mr. President, we need to get you down to the bunker. 
No, I'm going to run the country from here, right? You've seen that in a few movies, few life situations. Sometimes you have to do that. Uh, but more important, why does Nehemiah imply he might die if he goes into the temple, right? How could a man like me go into the temple and live? Because Nehemiah is not a priest. And God had set some rules up. He said, there's different people do different things. Okay, Nehemiah, your governor. The priests are the one that go into the temple to sacrifice for the people. No one else goes in there. That's very important. You may not live if you go in the temple. God does not tempt people to sin, right? Ergo, Nehemiah rightly concludes, this is not from God. I shouldn't do this. So, verses 12 and 13, Nehemiah continues his little side soliloquy to the writer here. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. They wanted me, like, if we get this done, Nehemiah first, we can call him a coward. He went to the temple. And we can say, hey, Nehemiah messed up. He wasn't supposed to go in the temple. He says, I, I got what they're doing. They're, they're causing me to be a coward, and they're causing me to sin. God's not in this. So, principle, when dealing with temptations, when you know what God has clearly said, anything and everything that contradicts that is not from God, even if it sounds good, because you know what he has clearly said. Even if the person who is speaking to you is you think is a faithful believer, or if the counsel seems practical, or if it has an air of spirituality around it. Because we know this from Paul's writings to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 15 say, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants as of righteousness. It's not a surprise that sometimes what seems like a good idea is not from the Lord. You don't get counsel from God that contradicts what he's told you. And he's clearly told us what we're supposed to do and not do. A biblical story that illustrates this. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. You can read it home later. First Kings chapter 13. There's an unnamed prophet who goes to tell evil King Jeroboam he's doing something wrong. He gets that corrected. He also hears, heals Jeroboam's withered arm. Jeroboam says, hey, I got a reward for you. Why don't you stay and eat with me? And the prophet says, I can't because the Lord told me, don't eat or drink on this mission and just come right home. Sorry, king, got to go. So he goes. And as he's going on his way, he meets another prophet without a name, unnamed older prophet. And this guy says, hey, um, the Lord told me, why don't you come aside and spend the night and eat dinner with me? And the prophet says, oh, okay, I'll do that. But he was contradicting what the Lord had told him. Don't eat, no drink, just go right home. Because this guy seemed like, well, I, the Lord told me to tell you to do that. All right. And he winds up dead. In fact, in one of the more amusing scenes in the Bible, men come along the road and they see an odd scene. There's a dead guy and a donkey standing next to him and a lion who killed the guy standing next to him. And the lion and donkey are both staring at each other, not doing anything, and dead prophet on the ground. And they go, well... We should go tell somebody about this. <laughs> there's, hey, there's, a, there's a lion and a donkey and a dead guy out there. You want to go? See? Yeah, it's, it's quite. But it's a tale of he knew what God had said. And then he mistakenly said, oh, wait, but this guy says something else. Maybe I should do something else. No, God said it. <laughs> he doesn't give counsel contrary to himself, does he? Does he? 
Okay, good. We're good. We're, we're there. All right. So, verse 14 goes to prayer. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Nehemiah leaves it all in God's hands to deal with. The enemies, even the so-called prophets. He says, Lord, it's yours. In verses 15 and 16, it says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month, Elul, in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Elul is the sixth Hebrew month. It's like August into early September for us. So that makes this whole project go from about mid-July and it finishes around Labor Day. 52 days and the wall was built. Somebody asks, how come we're only halfway through Nehemiah and the wall's done? We'll, we'll answer that in the coming weeks. But the big point here is their accomplishment was so incredible, rebuilt the wall in 52 days, even their enemies knew they didn't get this done with their own strength, their own planning, their own expertise. No, God did this. And oh, that something so good would happen in our church body that even people who are out in town who are not believers would say, God is at work among these people. We pray for that. We pray for that. So here I'm going to pause to make an important but lengthy point about the opposition Nehemiah faced. Was the opposition really the three stooges, or is the real evil something else? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, kind of a commonly known passage, says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. When someone plans to do you harm, they are not really your enemy. And our response should be with that in mind. Because the weapons God gave us to fight spiritual enemies are not physical weapons, and they aren't even words. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Satan and his forces did not want this project completed. Nehemiah got this. And so Nehemiah said, you know what? I'm going to go put on my breastplate of righteousness to do the right thing. I'm going to go put on my belt of truth to say the right thing. And I'm going to thwart the enemy's plans. Right? And if any of you really sharpies out there just listen to what I said and you thought in your head, well, Tom, uh, technically, me and I didn't know about the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth because, you know, that was Paul writing to the Ephesians and Nehemiah didn't have Ephesians. And so, you know, the analogy is not perfect there. Did, did, I, did anybody actually think that? All right, so anyway, that would be a good point. Nehemiah didn't have Ephesians, but you know what? Nehemiah had Isaiah. And did you know, brothers and sisters, that in your Bibles, when the Holy Spirit breathed the words for Paul to write about the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, sword of the Spirit, these were not completely new analogies at that point because we have this passage in Isaiah chapter 59 our small group was working this with with a uh, friend Fred Hepler a month or so ago Isaiah 59 16 and 17 says he that's God saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. 
Jehovah God fashioned a breastplate of righteousness and wore it himself. Jesus, when he was tempted in the desert, wore, as it were, a breastplate of righteousness and a shield of faith to extinguish those darts of Satan. And brothers and sisters, here's something I think I understand now that I did not get some time ago. I had always viewed the armor of God. Well, why is it called armor of God? Well, it's, it's a gift from God. He, he got it for us to wear for our spiritual battles. And, and that's good. And that, that should be good enough. Right? God got something for me. But it's, it is better than that. God wore this armor. That's why it's called the armor of God. And he says to me and you, hey, this worked really well for me. And I think it would work really well for you too. Amen. And we should be like four-year-olds who get to try on daddy's clothes and use daddy's tools and say, I, I'm being just like daddy. When we, we should say, the armor of God that's what I want, to fight my spiritual battles. How can you not want that? So Nehemiah effectively brushed aside each of those things that were sent to distract him from getting done what God had called him to do. And friends, when God calls you to do something, everything else is just a distraction. So let's review some principles Baitings, rumors, temptations. Principle, when someone's baiting you, ungodly person doesn't have best interest at heart. You just leave it alone. Principles, when there's rumors about you, you don't need to respond to false, phony threats. The truth's going to defend you. Let the truth defend you. And principle number three, when people are tempting you, when you know what God has said, Everything else you hear, it's not from God. Something I noticed after the sermon was 98%-ish complete is that in this chapter, Nehemiah followed Psalm 1 very well. In the first psalm, the first three verses, we read this. Blessed is the man who walks not first in the counsel of the wicked, nor... Second, stands in the way of sinners, nor third, sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. Nehemiah refused to get counsel from lying Shemaiah. He didn't stand with the sinner's phony threats. He didn't listen to the scoffing baitings of Sanballat. And in the end, whatever Nehemiah did prospered. How about that? One last thing, one last reminder of something we've seen in Nehemiah over and over just like the armor of God passage in Ephesians ends with an exhortation to always be in prayer, Nehemiah was always in prayer, asking the Lord for protection against his enemies and then claiming the promises of protection that God had made. So with that in mind, I'd like to end today by all of us together praying out loud another psalm this is Psalm 91, a classic promise of his protection from the unseen enemy, which we might face sometime. And it's applied to all those who follow him. So I'd like us to stand together, because you're going to stand for the last song anyway, and pray this prayer out loud, all of us together. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, 
my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Please remain standing.
Just a quick reminder that we have a meeting this evening at uh, 5 o'clock. See many of your faces here again. Looking forward to that. Well, Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let your work be credited to God. Others will recognize the true author. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for our time to gather. Thank you for the saints that are here. Thank you for the labors that you prepared for them, as you prepared the labors for Nehemiah, and he did not drift off his his course that you had set before him. He was not dissuaded. He was not distracted. He was not deceived. He remained on course. We're thankful for that testimony, thankful for the word that Tom's brought forth today. Go with our brothers and sisters today and guide them and bring them back safely tonight. In thy name, amen.